with me right now is Jonathan Turley, who was scrambled on Saturday like me uh, because it looked like the president of the United States through Truth Social was saying he's going to be indicted today. Uh, the constitutional law professor used his expertise. But, Jonathan, it's not happening today, is it? No, it's more likely to happen next week. But they have more uh, testimony today, so it seems highly doubtful. All right. So also, do you know who we're hearing from? You know, there's a rumor that Cohen might be going uh, to the grand jury today, uh, but we're really not clear. We just had the testimony of Costello, who was a rebuttal witness, uh, telling the grand jury essentially not to believe Michael Cohen. So the prosecutors may be reinforcing Cohen's t- uh, testimony and, and evidence. Uh, yeah, I mean, how many times is he going to speak to the grand jury? Will this be the first time or the hundredth time? I, I, I thought he's been speaking nonstop for five years. Yeah, he's been certainly a frequent flyer in, in, in these uh, testimonies. Uh, but look, this guy is really Johnny the Human Torch of witnesses. I mean, he's he'll do fine in a grand jury where there's no opposing lawyer. But once he gets into cross-examination in a real court of law, it's going to be a target-rich environment. So this is – I was shocked by Robert Costello. How significant is it that the former legal advisor to Michael Cohen, who got his attorney-client uh, privilege released by Cohen himself, how unusual is it that he gets a chance to speak in front of the grand jury? This is really unheard of. When I first saw his statements, I have to tell you, I, I was somewhat repelled. I mean, the, as a criminal defense attorney, I just don't like to see, even with waivers, attorneys calling out former clients. It, it's not good for the legal system. But Cohen actually may have made this worse by going on uh, a, a, a network and saying that he doesn't remember ever signing any waiver of attorney-client privilege, and he doesn't think that Costello was his lawyer. Costello then went on Tucker Carlson and held up (laughs) a waiver uh, and said, this is Cohen's signature. Now, that could prove actually somewhat damaging because Cohen, of course, is going to be examined on his long history of lies and fraudulent conduct. But just before the prosecution, he's now added another such claim. I mean, either he forgot what would normally be a major legal moment when you're waiving attorney-client privilege, or um, he was misleading the public again. But either way, he could face this in cross-examination, and they could call Costello as a rebuttal witness. Now, with the grand jury, you usually want to, if you're the DA, put on people that back up your case, correct? So that's why Costello going up there was unusual. He could easily have said, no, I don't want to do this, correct? He didn't have to put Costello in front of the grand jury. Well, there's a couple of reasons to do it. One is to convey that this wasn't a railroad operation where the the grand jury heard no opposing views, because it really doesn't matter that prosecutors largely control grand juries, and it's unlikely to change their mind. The second reason is it gives the prosecutors a free look at what could be a damaging rebuttal witness. So they've got him uh, in testimony, and they can use that to rebut his testimony if he makes any changes at trial. So I want you to hear what Jim Jordan plans on doing. Cut 14. I'm sorry, cut 10. Yeah. That's a concern for us. We want to know what kind of communications may have taken place between the Justice Department and because remember, the Justice Department didn't bring this case. They, they weren't going to do it. No right. one was going to do this until Mr. Bragg came along. Uh, that to me is, 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 a, is a real concern here. So he's going to ask Bragg to come in, for, from, in front of his committee and he try to explain why this is worthy of our time and his time and who basically is put him up to it if there is anybody. Is, have you ever seen anything like that? No. And look, I'm a huge critic of this uh, uh, upcoming indictment. I think it's deeply flawed, and I believe it is a political prosecution. However, I'm not crazy about Congress pulling in prosecutors either. I mean, this is not the first prosecutor to yield to political temptation. I would prefer to leave it to the courts, quite frankly. Uh, now, there is a danger here for Trump. This is an absolute nightmare of a jury pool. Yep. And, you know, New York judges have a tough decision to make. I mean, for a New York judge to dismiss a case like this would border on self-immolation. I mean, it, it, it would not go over well uh, with New Yorkers. 
I, I guess uh, I guess some in Manhattan, but some other, I'd like to think there's reasonable people who think this is absolutely ridiculous. Do we going to have a situation, Jonathan, where we're going to see his fingerprinting and his mugshot next week? We could. What's interesting is that uh, Bragg said, I'm not going to let you do a virtual arraignment. And the question is, why? This is not just another defendant. You know, this is something that no doubt the Secret Service requested. Uh, it's a bad situation for the Secret Service uh, to move someone through these crowds, uh, to have this sort of circus at the courthouse. But it's great for Bragg. And, you know, he, he, this is his moment. He may lose the case. But he'll win the politics of the moment if he can force Trump to go through this undignified process. I see. I, I don't know. If, do you really see it that way? There's a lot of reasonable people who think this is totally unreasonable outside the, the partisans. Well, that's the, that's the issue, though, is that Bragg is just playing to New Yorkers. That's not the that's not America. I mean, that's the, these are New Yorkers that defeated Trump by over 40 points. And so for him, the politics are obvious and they're good. Even if the case gets thrown out, he's unlikely to be blamed by New Yorkers. This is a thrill kill prosecution. And he knows it. Now, for other people who are not partisan, then, yeah, they, a lot of us are looking at this and going, my God, you know, there are some legitimate questions raised in other cases that you can agree or not agree with. But this is way beyond the pale. But that's not the audience that Brad Bragg is playing to. So I want you to hear the Georgia case. Trump's Georgia lawyers are seeking to quash this special grand jury. As sources say, the Fulton County prosecutors probing election now seek to question Trump's attorney. So where are we at in that process? And will the quash be successful? Yeah, it's probably not going to be successful. You know, the Georgia case it, it represents more of a threat, but I think it's also very weak. I've always said that the greater threat for Trump remains Mar-a-Lago. The the allegations there are well-established uh, charges, well-established case law. That's a serious threat. Georgia is serious in that they're making a conventional claim here for a criminal indictment. I just think that the evidence doesn't support it. I mean, that they're, they're ultimately going to base this in large part on a conversation. It was sort of like a settlement uh, negotiation with the other side. And they would have to try to get the jury to adopt um, only one interpretation of this line where he says you only need to find 15,000 votes it, to say go and make them up. There's a perfectly good alternative interpretation yeah. that he was trying to say if you do a statewide survey, it doesn't require a lot of votes to, to be overturned for me to get a new election because I'm only 15,000 votes away. That's a per since this was a settlement discussion, that's a perfectly valid point to raise. Yeah, I 100 percent agree. The Mar-a-Lago one, I'm under the impression that it might be neutralized because in the big picture, they know the uh, they know that Merrick Garland has an investigation to the current president and former vice president. And it got so far that they actually raided or took uh, documents from his lawyer's Boston office. So they took that. They went to both his homes. They took his office uh, stuff, um, his uh, University of Pennsylvania office. And you're really going to go in there and go after the former president for documents that they were negotiating on? I thought that might neutralize that case. You don't feel that way? I, I'm not so certain. I think that it should. I think that Merrick Garland has the final word, even with the special counsel in the field, actually two, he ultimately makes the decision on what justice demands. And that, inqu that inquiry includes whether this is consistent with other cases. The problem with Mar-a-Lago is that it doesn't have just the unlawful possession of classified material. If that were the case, I'd say it was a dead letter. But the FBI has primarily focused on the obstruction claims, that there were false statements given to uh, the FBI and the allegation that these were made with Trump's knowledge. We don't know the evidence there, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a dead letter uh, particularly with a right. special counsel, because they tend to want to see charges. Generally, special counsels don't like to do this for recreation. Unbelievable what's going on. Uh, Jonathan Turley, thanks so much. 
I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilmeade. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.